Let's talk about the Midwest. And um, one of the things I want to do uh, is uh, give you an example of what permaculture applied uh, looks like in Becky's and my own life. All right, so this is what the house looked like when Will was born. All right, matter of fact, William was born in this room right here. So anyway, this is what the house looked like back in that day. And then we learned about permaculture. So here's kind of from the same ang angle. Here's the sidewalk coming across, the sidewalk going up. And here's this ash tree with this big branch that comes off. Here it is about 20 years later. Same sidewalk and everything. I'm gonna come over here and set the camera up right here so you can see what it looks like just looking down the, the sidewalk. All right. So pretty much we started with, you know, what we call the tree grass bush yard. And, um, and now um, Becky estimates we have somewhere between 150 and 200 different varieties of plants uh, in our yard. And much of this, I'd say half of this was conscious design and the other half was observing and going with the flow. What is this showing up? We didn't ever had this before. Let's see what this turns out to be and letting it grow and then finding out what it is and seeing if there are uses for it. And if there are, then we grow more of it. And if they're not, we move it along somewhere else. But it's been an evolutionary process and I thought it would be helpful for you all to see, well, what does it look like and what are the steps you go went through to get to this point. So this is just a, you know, um, a little story of the journey. Here's our lot. We, it's exactly a quarter of an acre and there's our lot line. Um, my mom and dad lived right here. Mom has passed away, but dad is still here. He's with us, he's 98. And our neighbors are right over here. This is north, you see the compass on here. So it's not up, it's kind of heading up here to the Northwest is what north is. So. Um, but to fit this on the page, I, I turned it. Here's what a topographical map looks like on our property. So you can see the house is sitting on the high ground, but water drains away from our house and still from dad's house as well. Our two houses are on what's known as a knoll. And then all the water moves away 360 degree, degrees away from that. This is high ground. Everything else is low ground. This is how water's moving. Water moves perpendicular to the contour line. So if you ever get a map and wherever the contour line is, the contour line is marking that point on the landscape. If water was flooding the landscape as the water comes up and you just stop right there and draw a line on the, on the map, that's the contour line. And so water moves perpendicular to that line. In reality, this is how water moves off of our property. Uh, good engineering, when you build a house in a suburb, you always build all the houses are a little higher than uh, the surrounding ground, if at all possible, so that the water sheds away from the house. It tends to go to the property line, but the other house is doing the same thing. So the property line tends to be the lowest spot between the houses and the water moves off the property. The desire in civil engineering or community engineering, residential engineering is get the water off the land as quick as possible just the opposite of what we want to do, all right? Now we don't want to hold water next to our basements, but there are places we can hold water in the landscape without hurting um, the basement. So here's how we designed our front yard. So when it was just tree, grass and bush, um, we there was a downspout here and a downspout here, these two kind of Eastern facing here. But we closed this downspout so two thirds of the water would come down the gutters and run down this one downspout. Then we dug a ditch along the sidewalk. And uh, as the water came down the downspout, we put in a little uh, tube, uh, a drain tile, plastic drain tile to take the impact of the water. And then it, when it comes out, it's nice and bubbly and, and um, kind of ripples out very gently into the, rain, into the swale. And the first rain garden, which is right here, is about an inch lower than the rest of the property. So the first flush of water that comes out runs into rain garden number one, runs across the entire rain garden until there's about an inch of water in there. Then it comes out of the rain garden, comes down the swale to rain garden number two, and now the water moves across rain garden number two. Once again, that rain garden gets about uh, an inch of water in it. And then I have a drain towel underneath the path there and the water comes up and starts going through that drain tile into rain garden number three. Now it starts moving across rain garden number three until it reaches the end. And then at this point, 
you no longer see water moving through the landscape. What happens here now is the water in all three rain gardens rise simultaneously. It is the coolest thing to watch. If I had a gutter sitting right here, a four foot gutter, and it was closed on both ends and there's no hole in the bottom, basically it was like a four foot long flower pot. If I pour water in on this side, what happens? Water's gonna go across like this, but once water gets across and it bounces back and forth a little bit, as I continue to pour water in on one side, you don't see water moving, just the water rises up simultaneously, right? What if I poured water in on this side, what would happen? Goes over here, bounces back and forth, and then as I continue to pour over here, the water just rises evenly. That's the nature of water, it seeks, it seeks a common level. So that's how this works. And then once the, the lowest point in the system is a little teeny, what I call feeder swale that I cut off of here at the end here. If I didn't do anything, the water wanted to move off the property this way, but I've dug a little bit of a feeder swale this direction. And when the water comes out of rain garden number three, it comes over here. And how do you suppose, where did I find the dirt to create a berm along my property line? Oh, what snap. I just cut one, two, three rain gardens and an entire swale. I have lots of soil. I put all that topsoil in a berm along here. And now the water comes. I've got gooseberries and currants planted along there. The water comes along, works its way down along the bank here, I mean, along the berm. And at the very end here, I made a little bit of a J in the berm. So the water could just wrap right around. The water hits the end of that berm and then the water backs up about two feet behind that berm. And then it wraps around and then it goes off the property. So instead of the water coming right off of these downspouts, coming across and going off the property, now it takes this horseshoe shaped journey through our yard, backs up to this berm, and, I, and then it spills over. It probably only does that two or three times a year. Most of the time, all the water in our front yard, front yard and off the front part of the roof ends up soaking into our yard. We don't let it get to the street. Once the water hits our street over here, I might as well put a little boat on there with a little flag and a little welcome note say, hello, Gulf of Mexico. Because the water that runs, once it hits my street, it's gonna run down our storm sewer system, goes down underground, runs into Kelly Creek through a, a drain tile, a, a, a storm sewer system. And Kelly Creek runs to the Vermilion, the Vermilion to the Illinois, the Illinois to the Mississippi, and the Mississippi, you know where that goes. That water, once it leaves my property, is going to the Mississippi. Now, the water that soaks into our ground, it eventually will make it to Kelly Creek because it's we're part of the Kelly Creek watershed. So that water will eventually make it to Kelly Creek, but it might take it a year or two years to get there. And slowly but surely, we're saturating the ground below our property on that journey to Kelly Creek. Eventually, it'll make it to the Gulf of Mexico, but anything planted between our house and Kelly Creek now can access more water than it had before we started holding water on our landscape. Does that make sense? Remember how water plumes through the landscape? That's how it works. And we've been doing this now for 14 years. So we estimate we hold between four and 10,000 gallons of water every time, by the time it spills over. If the ground is like it is right now, it's really saturated out there. Everything is full right now because it's been drizzling all day. Every single earthworks is full. But um, so it's wrapped around here, it's coming off here. But um, probably since today was already wet, we held about four or 5,000 gallons. But in the middle of summer, when this soil is bone dry and we've got cracks in the soil, we have a lot of clay in our soil. And you have cracks that get so wide to put your fingers down there. You can take a garden hose, turn it on, put it in one of these cracks and the water never comes up. It just goes from crack to crack to crack to crack all the way through. But when it's when the most satisfying thing that, that I experience in our yard is when we've had some bone dry weather in the summer, we get one of those torrential rainstorms and the water comes rushing down the gutters into the rain garden and the water comes to that first crack in the rain garden and it goes down over like Niagara Falls and just disappears. Water's just pouring down this crack. And then finally the water comes up and then moves along, goes down to the next crack and down it goes and up and then down the next one. We're just all of that water, we're soaking it all in. Incred incredibly satisfying. And that's where I estimated we're probably catching about 10,000 gallons. Cause I know how much is coming off the roof and I know um, 
about what when it when it overflows here, I know approximately how many uh, gallon. We're going to talk about this, but for every thousand square feet of roof, when you have a one inch rain, you're going to have 623 gallons come off of your roof. Matter of fact, we're going to talk about this probably in the next 15 minutes. <laughs> So that's what it works out. Here's what it looks like the uh, spring after we cut the rain gardens in. This is the following spring. There's the ditch, there's rain garden number one and two. So the first thing you design, remember we talked about the scale of permanence a little bit late yesterday. So the first thing we designed for is water. Do you remember what the second thing we designed for? It's an interesting, it's an interesting twist. I wouldn't have expected it, but it's access, the path system. So here, here's what it looks like without any paths. And here's what it looks like when we put the paths in and mulch the beds. Do you see what happens? Once you put the paths, we know we wanna walk through here somehow, right? So we put the paths in, we literally took garden hoses out and started making it out, figuring out where we wanna go. We wanna get around this rain garden, go over here, get to the back of the house. So we, we this, it just made sense. So this is where we wanna go. We crossed over here, made a little bridge to walk over the, um, the swale, and then we went ahead, we cut the sod out, and we used the sod on the back of the property. We created a berm back there, and then we backfilled with, this is the hardwood bark mulch. This is hardwood bark shredded mulch, and so it's long and it's stringy, and because of that, and because it's hardwood and it's bark, it's dark in color. This is its natural color, and it weaves together, and it creates a pretty solid nap, which minimizes the amount of weeds that come up, and also creates a very soft surface to walk on. And it's also, I think, relatively attractive. I think it's more attractive than big chunks of wood chips. So we did this purposely in our front yard so it would be attractive to the neighbors who are wondering what in the world are you guys doing to your yard, All right? So this was the very first spring, 2008, and this is what it looked like. And here's what it looked like in 2013. And here's what it looks like more recently. Same window, same corner, everything's the same. Right? Things do grow. You put things in the ground. And it's just like, this is a lesson in trust. Man, will this thing ever grow? <laughs> and eventually they do. And when they do, it's pretty exciting. Here's what the, um, the swale looked like next to the sidewalk. And we put it right next to the sidewalk. The sidewalk had started to sink. And in the winter time, it literally would, water would collect on the sidewalk because it was below the, the grass. And water would literally run down our property on that and turn into a sheet of ice. So I put that on there so the water would um, tip off into the swale and we would drain some of the water off the sidewalk as well. And it worked really well. But here's what it looked like. I mean, I know it's pretty obnoxious looking, but um, it worked. And here's the first one of the first rains in the spring. And here's the same angle uh, 10 years later. The rain gardens are still there. The ditch is still there. The swale is still there. But it's, everything's filled with plants now. It still functions the same way. The water still comes down here, goes into rain garden number one, then comes out here. Everything's the same, but it's all under plants now. And because the plants are in here, it used to be the water would sit in these rain gardens for three days. We have a very high clay content, and now it's barely a day. So we went from three days to, so we basically we can absorb three times as much water than we could before. It's absorbing that well. Um, this is a cherry tree guild with uh, hazelnut, chives, raspberry, lemon balm, wormwood, and other ground covers. Here's rain garden number two and number three going across the yard. And here's what it looks like from basically the same angle 10 years later. Actually, this rain garden we kind of keep open because we kind of like to be able to see the water. And actually, when we give tours and talk about it, it's kind of nice to see the water in the rain garden. Otherwise, you have to lift, lift up leaves and braids of, blade, blades of grass. So well, there's water down here. And sure enough, you know, everything is sitting in water. Bill? Yes. Um, how do you keep it from silting in? Do, do you have that kind of problem? The, the swales? And... 
and such? It's very, very slow, Jan. And um, so my guess is, is that eventually, probably over 30 years, I think probably everything will just about fill in. There'll be a lot of, you know, stuff um, that, you know, um, it's just, it, I'm sure it's risen a little bit. And with the root structures in there, things have risen. The swales aren't quite as deep as they used to be. I did uh, dig the swales out one time. I cleaned them up and uh, opened them up a little bit. But um, it's not a big problem. It's not a big project. The idea is, how do I hold water on the landscape? It doesn't have to maintain a certain thing. When we do earthworks, primarily what we're doing, it's what you would refer to as triage. It's emergency work. And so the goal is once you get the plants established, the plants will do the job of taking the water and sinking it into the ground. But it helped to get the plants established, we do the emergency work of doctoring up the landscape, putting in swales and berms and rain gardens and holding that water to give the plants we do put in the ground a chance to get established. But even a swale system is not intended to be there forever. It's intended to be there until the plant system you establish now does the job that the swale uh, started to do. Okay, thanks. Sure. What percentage of plants did you guys plant there compared to what came up naturally? I just have to be guessing here, Mary, but... Um, yeah. It's probably more like at least two thirds to maybe 80% is stuff we planted. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then, and then I can't tell you of that, the stuff that we planted, way over half of it is stuff that we found somewhere and just somebody gave us a plant. Right. All right. Okay. I mean, we don't buy a whole lot of stuff. I mean, we have, but it's amazing when you start looking for stuff and people, oh, God, can you take some of this? Can you plant? You know, it's really fun. And then we do the same thing, you know. Well, we got to thin this stuff out. See who wants some of this, that, and the other things. Yeah. Here's rain garden number three. Here's that little ditch I, uh, I dug to bring the water over to the berm. And here's that berm. And here's the exact same spot. There's actually a little ditch underneath the grass that you can't see, but it still spills over and follows that little path. Now, that, that, little, uh, that little spillway, that little um, feeder swale or drain swale, I probably dig that out every two to three years. I'll get the shovel in there and take the sod out that's formed up because I want to be sure it drains out. Hey, Bill. Yes. I'm curious, how much is native and not native, or is that ever really a concern for you? Sean, I don't know. How, I don't know how to answer that. I don't know what's native anymore. I'm just not up on that. Yeah. Thanks for asking, but I'm sorry, I don't know. Becky would have a much better idea. Will, if you have any suggestions or even Megan, feel free to jump in there. And then here's what it looks like when it was first dug. And uh, here's what it looks like today. So uh, in the spring early on, uh, it rained. And here it is two days later, there's still water in these rain gardens, right? So, and they're still wet, but two or three days after that, they dry out. And now if you don't get rain for two or three weeks, or even in the summertime, it doesn't rain for six to eight weeks, which is a long time for us here. The bottom of these swales, we have about 12 to 15 inches of topsoil, which has got a certain amount of organic matter in. But for these rain gardens, we basically cut down 12 inches at a 45 degree angle, cut flat across, and removed all of the topsoil with all the organic matter in it and are planting in one or two, three inches of topsoil, but then it's pure clay underneath. And when it gets bone dry, the clay cracks and the ground opens up. And um, so the plants that are in the bottom of that rain garden, you do not plant water loving species in the bottom of a rain garden. Because the only time you have water in there all the time is in the spring. You have to grow plants that can tolerate super wet conditions in the spring and bone hard, dry desert conditions in the summer. They have to be tough plants. You're never gonna get cattail growing here or anything in that family, water lilies. This is not a water environment. This is a way, place to hold water when it rains, but in the summertime, it's gonna be bone hard, dry. These are the winners, day lilies, <laughs> certainly mint and lemon balm, right? Day lilies, comfrey, curly willow, Jerusalem artichoke, which is kind of nice that it grows there. And then uh, any, any kind of prairie plant, deep-rooted prairie plant can survive just about in the bottom of that rain garden. 
It's a unique, very unique environment. All right. I just want to make sure you understand that. So then uh, let's take a look at the uh, side of the backyard. Remember, here's how water is moving off the property. It's all moving away from the house and that runs directly towards the back of our house. A little bit of the water in the front here goes off into the street. By the way, the stuff that goes off into the back, it just goes across the backyard and then in, into the street back there. So that's, um, it's once it reads our property, it's gone. Let's take a look at this area right here. So we put in several beds. We have uh, had a real low spot here between my folks' house and our house. And no matter what we planted here, it was a low spot. So it was, everything was always drowning in the spring, sitting in water. Nothing would grow there. So we put a Hugo culture in. Those of you who don't know what Hugo culture is, basically what we've done is we dug out the area, dug out the bed, pulled out maybe about nine, 10 inches of soil, maybe 12. Then we bought, brought in some big chunks of firewood some real old gnarly stuff and some rather younger stuff. And we pack that firewood in there, kind of like Tetris, you put it in there and you back in with some soil and then you put some more wood, a little smaller, back in with some soil. So you pack that entire thing with soil and wood and then put a good three, uh, three inches of topsoil on top of that. And now when it rains, we can put a little bit of a moat around it. Now when it rains, the water collects that, wa collects that water and then it fills in and soaks up into that wood but everything we planted now is way above the water and it's not drowning any longer. And the water's being soaked up by the wood, holding that water for long periods of time. So whatever we planted now has access to water once it starts drying out again. That's what a Hugo culture is, all right? So if you've heard the term, that's all it is. It's pretty simple. We'll talk about it some more. And we put another Hugo culture in over here. These are kind of, kind of lower spots in the yard again. And then we put a, um, a raised bed here and a raised bed here, or berms here. And then we have a little raised bed in our compost bin there. So these are the features we have. Here's where our, our rain tank is. So we have 425 gallon tank here and we have a small aquaponic system over here and I'll show you a picture of that. So here's what we did with the water. Water comes off of my folks yard, my folks roof out of the front of my yard to that wet spot. It brings in, wraps around that bed and then it overflows, takes this journey. It used to go right down the property line, right off the property, but I cut a little bit of a berm into my yard, a little bit of a trench, moving it to the uphill side and brought it up right to the property line, taking all that water and bringing it into my yard. So now the water makes a journey into my yard, goes to this first Hugo culture, where I have a half moat around here, basically just a nice little ditch in front of it to capture that water. When that fills up, it spills over and I have a horseshoe shaped um, moat around this Hugo culture. When that fills up, it spills over into a little moat in front of that berm. When that fills up, it goes underneath the path and goes and backs up around this berm. The water that falls in this part of the yard I capture it in a small little feeder swale, just like the thing I showed you in the front yard, but it's, now it's capturing and bringing it to the berm. I capture that water, bring it in. This is one of the main planting areas in a yard. It was an area where we were getting the most sun, did most of our annual gardening in the earlier days in here. So I'm pulling the water into here. Off the roof, this is the back third of the roof. It's coming over here to the water tank filling up 425 gallons. When it spills over, it comes across the yard, runs right past the compost bin. What is it picking up when it goes past the compost bin? Nutrients. And runs right in to this area behind the berm. I'm capturing, capturing, capturing. We're using the water as many times as I can as it moves through the yard. And at some point, it's still raining. This berm starts to back up. What I don't want to do is have all this water wash over the top of this berm and wash my plants away or my soil away, right? So at this point, I set the feeder swale up on this landscape to certainly capture this water coming in, but it's set at a certain ele elevation. So when the water backs up about three feet behind this berm, the water now starts to back up the feeder swale. It's no longer coming in, water's backing out, and then it very gently spills through the grass. It's perfectly level across the lawn and it trickles through the clover and other little plants we have in there. You can't even barely see it, but all this water is coming through here and it's all coming off my property finally, but there is zero erosion. 
It's just trickling through the grass underneath the vegetation, no erosion. When you start doing earthworks, you're bringing water to a certain location. And once everything fills up, you've got to have a plan on where that water is going to go now. Otherwise, you can create a, a serious erosion problem, not just for yourself, but for the person who's ever downhill from you. You can create quite a, a challenge for them. So we need to think about that. Anytime we do earthworks, we're thinking about when it fills up, where's the water going to go? Okay, now I want you to know this didn't come to me. This didn't appear when the first time we started doing this work. All we could think about was the front yard. But slowly, as we started to understand this, we started to see the problems we observed, all this water is still going off our property. Why am I letting dad's water go off? Why don't I just bring it onto my property? You know, I didn't even ask his permission, right? And, um, and so these just, everything just started to fit together. So it was about a three-year journey to get to this point. But we really love it, and it works really well. And it's um, been doing it for, for uh, over 10 years now. So when we do a permaculture design, uh, you, if, for those of you who had a chance to look at the video, first thing we design for is water. So here's where water sits on the property. Then we design access. So here's the path system. The next thing we design is we define the vegetative beds or the garden beds. Where do we want to have production, if you want to call it? So we define the beds. You see how the paths automatically define the beds? This path that comes across here, it comes across this. These two paths cross, creating and defining a bed right here. These paths define this bed, these beds. So now we look at each one of those pockets and say, oh, let's put a guild in there. Let's put a cherry tree guild in there, uh, you know, a pear tree guild in there, an apple tree guild in here. And we put this, it was just like, it was so obvious then. But before we put the paths in, it's like, where do we put things? It's just, it's such a big palette. Put the pads in, and it starts defining areas, and now you design for one area at a time. It works. It's really, really handy. Then we put in the overstory. So as we're designing, these are the planting areas. Now I put in the overstory tree. So here's apple and cherry and peach, and um, you know we got hazel, aronia, different plants in here. And then these are the uh, understory plants. These are the majority of the understory plants that we put in around the overstory species. And then for a final design for a client, then we put on the, uh, the existing trees. So you can see all the trees with an X, those are the existing trees. Sometimes we identify them, but the, usually the client knows what they are. And we put in a signature block, the name of the client, you know, put in a scale so you know what, you know, how, how, how big of a space are we looking at? So you want to put some kind of a scale in there. And that's easy to do. And we, I explained that in the video uh, on when you create a permaculture design, how to get the scale. And there it is. That's a finished permaculture design. So if you're doing design work for clients, um, I charge about $2,000 for something like this without putting a plant in the ground, just thinking it through, figuring everything out, giving them a map. This is what I charge. And I call this a framework design. You know, I don't, I'm not telling the plant exactly what to plant under every single tree. I'm not even insisting that it has to be an apple or a pear or a cherry. I'm just saying, if we put the path systems in here, here's where you can put a guild here, put a guild here. I'm designing for that. Now, if they want, no, I want every plant and I want to know where to buy it and how much it costs, you know, okay, well, then it's a five to $7,000 design for a residential property with every last thing detailed out. So a landscape art, so a landscape, um, implementer, whatever you want to call those people, <laughs> landscaper can come in and just follow the design. I've only done two of those designs. Who wants that? And I tell you right now, I, re I resist it with all my heart because it's such a waste because once you get in, you're going to start seeing opportunities that I can't anticipate sitting in a desk here. Every design I've ever created, we've changed as we've implemented it. Every single one. They evolve on the spot, on the ground while you're there. The best way to design is to get your, figure out your earthworks, figure out where you want to hold water and start implementing and just take your time and enjoy the journey. Learn to play the instrument slowly. Make sense? Yeah. And it's really fun. <laughs> All right. So I just wanted to show you this. You can see that the, the, the rain garden is just flat bottom. It's about 12 inches deep. 
you see we just we, we didn't we don't cut perfectly straight we cut at about a 45 degree angle and we certainly threw some seed down and stuff clover was my, one of my favorite um, ground covers to plant anytime you do earthworks you should have a bag of seed one of my favorite things to use just for a real quick and get it covered and start fixing nitrogen is dutch white clover and then because it doesn't get real long or real deep or anything else like that and then i can plant anything else i want in there once the clover gets established it holds everything together then i can plant anything i want just by planting putting in a plant put a little mulch around it and uh, the clover is not strong enough to uh, choke anything else out. So uh, we did that, but a lot of it didn't take. A lot of it washed it down into the bottom the first time it rained and off it went. But the clover in the yard, uh, because it grows rhizomiously, it literally colonized and climbed right on down the, the, the bottom of the bank and started going across the rain garden into the other plants. So um, the, the plants will find the way down. But if that's a perfectly straight cut, not only is that an ankle buster, but there's no plant that can grow vertically down. So by a 45 degree angle, the plants, you have an invitation for plants to grow in. So here's what it looked like um, in uh, when we dug it. Here's what it looked like a year or two later. And here's what it looks like today. There's literally a rain garden in there. One of the favorite things I have is I've got a bunch of uh, corkscrew willow growing in there. And uh, we harvest that every year out of the rain garden. So that's called coppicing. That's where, so that this, I literally took cuttings off of a willow tree, brought it home, put a stick about 12 inches long, halfway into the ground, six inches into the ground, and it just started to grow. Willow will do that. That's one of the plants that does that. And we'll talk about that some more as well. And so now these plants have become established. If I didn't do anything, they would become massive 60, 70 foot high trees. But if you cut them off at the base every year, they never get bigger than uh, half an inch around in diameter. That's called coppicing. So from a great big tree, I'll get this annual supply of curly willow that's really beautiful for decorating. I'm up on the roof looking down the sidewalk. Here's rain garden number one and number two. Here's a couple of little guilds. And here's the same angle 10 years later. Here's rain gardens one, two, and three. Rain gardens one, two, and three. And here's the back corner of the house. Here's tree, steel post, and gutter. <laughs> here's tree, steel post, and gutter 10 years later. And just wood chip pads is all we use. And they're just so low maintenance and they're so easy and comfortable to walk on. And anytime I want, if I need to get water across the path, all I do is bury a pipe, put some wood chips on top of it. And so I can keep move, water moving wherever I want in the property. It's just very, very simple. Finally, I had to get a garden shed. I mean, I just can't. We have a house with no basement, no garage. We raised four sons in a house with no basement and no garage. Yes, that's called a miracle. What we did have in town is we helped start a tool cooperative. And there's about eight or 10 families that are involved in that. And we have a lot of things in one garage. So if I need a ladder or I need a lawnmower or a weed whip or a rototiller or a pressure washer or all the things that you keep in your garage, even a carpet steamer, they sit in the tool co-op and we share the ownership of those things. And anytime I need something, I just go over the tool co-op, get it, bring it home, use it and take it back to the tool co-op. Is that cool or is that cool? Yeah. We've been doing that for 40 years. Started with a lawnmower and just grew from there. So, but anyway, now I got some of my own stuff and I wanna share it. So I want my own stuff in my own shed. Here's the water tank right here. And I'll show you that again. Here it is from the side when we first put it in. And I literally, I wanted as high as possible. When we first put a rain garden in, I mean, excuse me, when we first put a tank in, we started with, of course, a 55 gallon drum. We're all excited and got it all figured out, you know, and real precise. And, and the first rain was a downpour. I mean, it just poured. And I'm out there with an umbrella. I'm so excited, right? How long do you think it took to fill a 55 gallon drum in a downpour? It wasn't even two minutes, <laughs> two or three minutes, and water's pouring everywhere, and I'm getting buckets, you know. And uh, so this is ridiculous. I mean, I need a big tank. So this fits in the back of a pickup truck. These are very easy to find. They're very common. 
they make them by, by the bazillions. So, I mean, I think it was, you know, 175 bucks or something like that. They're probably 300, $350 now. But um, it's uh, easy to get a hold of, easy to transport if I need to. And then the reason it's up off the ground is head pressure. If it's sitting on the ground and I've got a garden hose hooked to it and I pick up the garden hose, water stops running, right? Because the water's down there. So by putting it up in the air, I get head pressure. And now I attach a garden hose to it and I can go anywhere in my yard and water from it. And literally, then I put a big valve on it and a nice size opening. When I open that valve and that tank is full, I mean, water comes crashing out of there. I mean, I can run a sprinkler, you know, till the tank is about maybe two thirds down. And after that, there's not enough pressure anymore. And then you have to just use the water with a hose or something. It's not as much pressure as the house. So the house pressure, that's 45 PSI, probably coming out of the tank, it's more like 20 or 25 PSI. But the volume comes out, it's pretty substantial. I love Does this it tank. Freeze? Does it freeze during the winter? If I had water in it, it would. By the way, here's how I camouflage it. And I actually, I'm going to come back to that, Mary. I put these, um, these uh, boards on there. We put them, the kids were still kind of small, or Hayden was still small. And we put them on there that way purposely so the kids have something to climb up on. And quite literally, they would climb up and jump on the roof and you know, I mean, you know, we have sons and, you know, after you have two or three survive, you don't care if the other two get killed, you know, you just kind of, um, you know, let them, let them, let them run a little bit more wild. But uh, we've got hours and hours of time off by the children playing on these different fences that we've set up around our house because they're so um, conducive to that. And I'll show you the other one. But just so you know, this, um, this rain tank is, is, is connected to the gutter on the back side of the house. And there's one gutter that runs the length. And what happens is in the summertime, I close the gutter at this end. There's two downspouts on both ends. I close the one on the far end. So all the water that comes off the roof goes into the tank. And it fills up over and over and over again. But in the fall, when things are starting to freeze and we're done watering, we don't need water anymore. I block this downspout. I open the one on this side. And now all the water runs down this way for the winter. Matter of fact, it's still in that situation right now because it's, we still have freezing weather coming. But I have, I have frozen off the, um, the valve twice on that tank where I got anxious. I want to start getting water in the tank. And the water, literally, the water, it's, uh, the water of the tank doesn't freeze, but the water in the spigot, because it's so small, it freezes and it expands and splits the, the valve. So I had to replace the valve. So, you know, we wait until usually the end of April before we start switching the tank over. And we really don't need water before that much. Good question, Mary. And here's the number right here, how much rain comes off your roof. So you literally, from the, um, the, the information that we gave you on those videos. So if some of you have a chance to look at those videos between now and Saturday, um, we'll save a few minutes on Saturday to answer questions about those videos about accessing the digital data and then about how you uh, apply onto uh, PowerPoint or to uh, Google Slides. But you can, you, in that video, I talk about how you could literally run a cursor around your house and get the exact, by looking at your house from the top down from Google Earth, you can get the exact square footage exact pretty accurate square footage of your house. And now you multiply that times 0.623 gallons for every square foot, then you'll know in a one inch rain, how much water comes off of your roof. Our roof is just under 2000 square feet. So we get uh, about 1200 gallons of water off of our roof in a one inch rain. That's handy to know. Now, and on this side of the house, that uh, I measure just because all the water that goes in the tank just comes from the back third, which is about um, uh, 650 square feet. So it's smaller, but I can still do the still do the math. Make sense? That's handy to know. When uh, when rain falls on the ground, let's say you have a, a parking lot you know, a Walmart parking lot or whatever, and you take a one acre parking lot, if you get one inch of rain on there, that's 27,154 gallons that comes off of an acre. That's referred to as an acre inch, right? So in big buildings, they literally start, you're, start, you're talking about thousands and thousands of gallons that come off of a large roof. 
But we'll come back to this uh, concept of an acre inch of water that comes up several times in the course. And this is just a little garden bed or kitchen bed right off the back porch. Here's that berm over here that collects the water and that feeder swale comes up right through here. Milton helped me dig that feeder swale back in the day. But this is just a little kitchen garden that me and the boys put in for Becky for Mother's Day one year. And it's right off the back porch so we can just walk right out here. Now it's mostly an herb garden and um, I'm already, already been cutting um, uh, allium out of there, garlic and onion out of there for breakfasts and for salads and stuff like that. So those are always the first things that come up. But you see, what do I have around that bed? A moat. And why? Why not? Hold that water soaking. Well, actually, actually, the main reason is I didn't have any soil to create a raised bed. But when you dig a moat, you got soil and you throw it in the middle, and now I've got a raised bed. And the moat is still there holding water right now. Okay. And here's our peach tree. Probably some of you have seen this picture. These peaches came off of this tree, just on another branch over here. She probably filled that bowl up six, seven times from that one tree. And we had just, that was peaches for the whole winter. We really love them. When, the, when peaches come in and they're just, they're that perfect thing. I mean, it brings tears to your eyes. It does mine. I mean, it is so sweet. It is so delicious. It's like, it's almost, it's, it feels unbelievable. It doesn't taste anything like fruit that you buy in a store. I mean, how many of you bought fruit you had three different kinds of fruit and it all tastes the same? Almost. You know, it's just bland. Uh, so it's it's the difference between having real food and um, plastic food. And then here's our aquaponics system. We'll spend some time here, but um, and when we get into ponds and aquaponics, we'll talk a little bit more about the details. But I just want to mention that this sits uh, right outside our front door, right down the end of our little porch. And we have we get so much enjoyment out of this little uh, uh, um, facility, whatever you want to call it, this little feature at our yard. There's actually three beds here full of pea gravel. There's one here, one here, and one here. There's a little pump down here, and it's on a timer. And every 30 minutes, the timer comes on for 30 minutes, and it shuts off for 30 minutes. On for 30 minutes, off for 30 throughout the day, and it's off at night. And what happens? Water, these beds are filled with pea gravel. Just gravel, there's no soil in there, pea gravel. The water goes all the way down to the bottom, fills up, then it spills over to the next bed. Then it goes to the bottom, fills up, spills over to the bottom, goes back. And so it goes all the way around. The fish, of course, poop in the water. Their nutrients come up and get washed through the beds. And the bacteria surrounding the pea gravel does the job of, trans of transforming the nutrient from the fish into nutrients that the plants can absorb. And so the plants are getting nutrients, but the other thing that happens is when the timer goes off and the water drains out of every one of these beds, what do you suppose is replacing it? When the water drains out, what's coming in behind the water? Somebody say air. air. Very good. And air holds the oxygen. So we're creating a perfect environment for root structures. They've always got moisture, they've always got nutrients, they've always got oxygen. And things we put in here grow really, really well. And it's so fun. The end, Ellen Becky's yard. Got it?